Good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone here. My name is Alan Katz, and I am the uh, founder of American Public Square. And I'd like to, uh, particularly at the beginning here, thank the people, the sponsors, who made this program possible. The Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and Ramon McGuire, and the Children's Mercy Hospital of Kansas City. We have two partners tonight who are helping us uh, in, in the efforts as we bring forward. One is uh, KCUR, uh, Public Radio, and the other is the Kansas City Star. We're going to be live streaming tonight's program on the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City Facebook. And, I'm, and, and the page is, for those of you who understand these things, which I don't, um, <laughs> uh, facebook.com slash hcfgkc slash. If you're not here tonight, but you're watching this on the live stream, you can still submit questions for our panel via Facebook. And uh, they will be brought to the uh, roving reporter. We're also tweeting tonight at American Public Square, hashtag APSKC. Did I, hopefully I got that right. Okay. American Public Square, for those of you that don't know, is a member organization, and we rely on the support of our members to make these programs possible. Now, if you're a member of American Public Square, would you please raise your hand? Okay, give yourself a hand. hand up. Okay, now, if you're not a member of American Public Square, raise your hand. Okay, those of you that are members, track down one of those non-members and sign them up tonight before we're through, okay? Uh, and those of you who have an interest in joining on the way out, there is an app, there's, a, there's something on the table, and you can stop and join on, the, on your way out. We'd love to have you. It was just over three years ago that we held the first American Public Square event. Uh, it was at the downtown library, and there were about 140 people there. How many of you, anyone here that was there that night? Okay, okay. It's beginning to look a little like who was at Woodstock, but that's okay. Uh, uh, anyway, we, when, when we began this, we, we, the idea was we wanted to start a conversation as opposed to a confrontation, which we thought was all too prevalent in our uh, discourse. And I think it's safe to say from tonight's turnout and the growth of American Public Square that we've experienced over three years, that this, is a con this conversation is something that people really are looking for. So before we begin the program tonight, I want to go over some of the ground rules for American Public Square programs. First of all, please turn off your phone or put your phone on vibrate so that it doesn't ring in the middle of the program. Secondly, you've each received a playbill tonight. Looks like this. It contains information on the panelists, the sponsors, and partners. It has information about upcoming American Public Square events and how to connect with American Public Square via social media and how to become a member. Six of these playbills have gold stars on the back. If you have one, you got a prize, raise your hand right now, and someone will bring you your prize. Try to keep people engaged. Okay. On the table, you'll find a question. Everybody check the back of it up. We got that done? We still looking for gold stars? Okay. Got some hands in the air. Bring, them, bring whatever their prizes are. Okay, number two, uh, you're going to find something that looks like this. It's a fact sheet, and it's also a uh, question sheet. If you uh, have a question that you would like asked, write the question out. There are pens on your table. If there's a fact or something is said by one of the panelists or one of the questions that you believe is factually incorrect, Write it down, hold it up, and it will be taken over to our fact checkers. You also have a survey on your table, and I was pointed out to me tonight that sometimes people take notes on their survey, and therefore at the end when we want your survey back, you don't hand it in. Therefore, tonight, for once, just make your programs on your, or your notes on your program and fill out the survey before you leave so we have an idea of how you liked the program tonight and what we can do to make it better. We have our roving reporter tonight, who is Ron Jones, who's KCUR Director of Community Engagement and a board member of American Public Square. Ron, where are you? Raise your hand. Ron's in the back there. That's Ron. Okay. Ron's going to be asking the questions submitted by you or coming for, to you to ask your own question. Tom Burns and Scott Curtis, raise your hands. Okay. These are UMKC librarians. They are our fact checkers tonight. Thank you both for being here and giving of your time to do this. Now, several members of our audience have what we call our civility bells. Anyone have a bell? Raise your hand if you've got a bell. Okay, ring the bell. 
Okay. If you hear that bell, panelists, that's the cue to stop talking. That means someone's become a little uncivil. We're trying to calm things down. Uh, we also ask that if you agree with something that you hear from one of the panelists, that you not applaud. If you agree, you should do this vigorously. And if you disagree, you should do this. But the point B is, is that we don't want to interrupt the flow of the, of the discussion that hopefully that we have done. And tonight we're introducing a new feature for the first time, and we're going to see whether or not it works. It's called, you know, each, the, at the end, the moderator is going to ask each of the panelists these questions. So what? And now what? The now what's the opportunity for each panelist to give audience members a recommendation of what they hope audience members will go out and do as a result of being here tonight and hearing the, con and hearing the conversation. In other words, a call for action. So I want to thank tonight's sponsors and, as usual, I got my sheets mixed up here. I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, we want you to, we hope all of this will help you not only to think and talk about what you hear at American Public Square events, but also to take action in our community on those things that you've heard. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bridget McCandless, the President and CEO of the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City. Bridget. Good evening. I'm not sure how well this mic picks up, so you can hear me? Okay. Um, it's my privilege to serve as the CEO of the Healthcare Foundation. We're 13 years old, and we work on issues related to those most in need. And the, the Healthcare Foundation obviously funds things related to health, but we also think of health as a broader issue than just health care. And that is why we have invested in food insecurity for several years. You will find access to our food insecurity calculator. It's a way to estimate what the costs are to businesses, to schools, to the community, and to health care for issues related to food insecurity. We have case studies in the back that I hope you'll take the time to read uh, on your way out. And on your table is part of that, so what, now what? This is our insecurity pledge. Now, I'm not asking for your social security number. I don't need a contribution. This is um, a commitment by you to think, to talk, and to act on food insecurity. I hope that you hear something tonight that sparks you to want to take action because this is an issue that takes collective response. The foundation is privileged to be able to set the table in a room like this for civic and civil discourse, which is often lacking. And we can see that perhaps this is now Kansas City's biggest living room to talk about what are complicated issues. And I'm, I'm just pleased that you would come and spend the evening with us. I'm gonna start by introducing my friend, Gretchen Kunkel, who uh, has been working in this field for more than 20 years. Since 2008, she has been the president of Casey Healthy Kids and has continued to do amazing work in this area. I know that you will enjoy her moderator, so please join me in welcoming Gretchen Kunkel. Thank you, Bridget. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, and I thank all of you for coming tonight. Okay, hopefully that's better. Can the people in the back hear me? Can you hear me? All right. Now it's my turn to introduce our panelists, and I'm just delighted to have these four people here who know so much about food insecurity. On my far end is Mary Kay Hendrickson. Mary is an assistant professor of rural sociology at the University of Missouri with a passion for making the world a better place through food. Her work focuses on the organization of different types of food systems and options for changing these systems. Mary worked for MU Extension for 15 years and helped create the Greater Kansas City Food Policy Coalition. Next is Bo Hine. Bo is the president and CEO of Nourish KC, 
formerly Episcopal Community Services, where he introduced Dining with Dignity, restaurant-style services to the Kansas City Community Kitchen. Bo has worked in soup kitchens and food pantries in New York City as a youth minister and school counselor. He scooped ice cream on the Rosie O'Donnell Show. Who wrote this? <laughs> Victoria? <laughs> and was a member of the Heartland Men's Chorus. Next to Bo is Lillian McNell. Lillian is an assistant professor of public health at Campbell University, where her research focuses on how hunger and food insecurity affect health and well-being and how people navigate their food environments. Lillian reached North Carolina, Carolina via New Jersey, where she grew up, and Florida, where she went to college. She loves animals and sings in a triangle bass a cappella group. I can't do that. <laughs> and next to me is Valerie Nicholson Watson. Valerie is the president and CEO of Harvesters, the Community Food Network, which serves 26 counties in northwestern Missouri and northeastern Kansas. Valerie previously served as president of the Niles Home for Children and in another life was a journalist. Named one of the 100 most influential African Americans in Kansas City, she is the proud grandmother of three grandsons. Please welcome our panelists. So let's get on to our questions and let's really discuss the issue of food insecurity. So in two weeks, we will be celebrating Thanksgiving. It's a time when we give thanks for friends and family and for our bounty of food. However, for many in our region, food is out of reach. Valerie, can you define what food insecurity is and what it means for individuals and families? Thank you, Gretchen. Yes, food insecurity is living in a state where you may have food today, but you might be uncertain of where your food will be coming from in the future. And then if you do have access to food, you might not have the resources to um, purchase or obtain adequate food that is also nutritious food. And you know, the, the so what of it all almost is that if you can imagine being a person in need and living under the stress of not having enough resources, and then also dealing with the stigma sometimes, if you are able to um, obtain assistance, it is just a very, very stressful um, way of living for someone, but then the consequences go even beyond stress, and, and we can talk a bit about the consequences of food insecurity, and particularly uh, food insecurity uh, at a sustained level. Bo, how in a country such as this, with so much wealth and abundance, how can we have people who still do not have enough to eat? That's a great question. I think when we look at our system in, in America, the, the idea that we all can make it here, that we can pull up our bootstraps and we have every resource at our disposal, I think it's easy to forget that those resources and things that we have all cost a lot of money and often are competitive. And so there are times we have to make decisions between paying our rent or sending our kids to school for their school project or a field trip and getting their school lunch um, to be able to put gas in our car and affording food. And I think often we ignore the consequences of not eating or eating unhealthy food because it's cheap. Um, I think now it's so easy for us to go through a drive through and pick up our food on the way home um, that we're not thinking about those health consequences of what that does for the next day or the day after. Lillian, is food insecurity the same as hunger? And what role does income, or more specifically, lack of income, play in food insecurity? I would say that <clears throat> hunger is a type of food insecurity, but they're not the same. Um, hunger, we are all familiar with, and that's a physical feeling and 
It means quite literally not having enough food to eat. Food insecurity is a more nuanced term. And um, echoing what Valerie said, it's when you're just not sure where your next meal will come from. It could mean that you eat um, enough in part of the month and, or part of the year, but not others. For example, when there's a holiday coming up and you're spending more on um, some foods than, than others, it could mean that you eat small meals to make your food stretch. You're skipping meals here and there. Or maybe the adults in the household are not eating so that the kids can. So it's, a, it's more of a temporary situation that can come and go in response to an, an, a, a big expense or a season um, or a fluctuation in income. And what was the second? How does income or lack of income play into it's, food insecurity? It plays a huge role. Um, as, as I mentioned, it a lot of times is in response to a big expense that comes up or a change in hours at work or a, a time of the year where you're spending more or less. Um, and um, ultimately, food is, is expensive. And while we are lucky in this country to pay less for food than in many other places, it's still something that everybody has to buy. So it plays a huge role, and household resources definitely determine how much and what you're able to buy. Food insecurity is a very complicated issue. What, Mary, are some of the other underlying causes behind food insecurity? Well, you know, we've been talking a lot about how people can't afford food, right? But then let's talk about who is producing food, like farm workers, restaurant workers, farmers, and they're not even making any money. So we got a cheap food system, and nobody's, make, nobody's making that much money, and then people still can't eat. So we've got a system-wide problem that we've got to think about and got to solve. So it's going to take lots of different ways of, of looking at the problem. But, you know, if food chain workers are among the most food insecure workers. They have some of the lowest median incomes in uh, uh, of all workers. Their median income is about $16,000, and I, I dare any of us to eat well on $16,000 a year in Kansas City. But think about that if you're living in California or someplace like that, right? So, I mean, it's these are significant problems, but still farm workers, they're picking our fruits and vegetables, and they're not. 47% of this um, Yolo County, California's farm workers couldn't even, um, didn't know where their food was going to come from. And these are people that are picking our fruits and vegetables. And then it gets worse when you go, you know, a lot of our fruits and vegetables come from um, to Mexico and further south, um, and wages are not good there either. So we've got a real conundrum. Food's too expensive, food's too cheap. So we got a problem. Lillian, are the causes of food insecurity different for different populations or groups? Consider children, seniors, homeless uh, individuals, or even communities of color. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I would say that the causes may not necessarily differ. Um, ultimately, it's a lack of access or affordability. But the, the prevalence is definitely different in different communities. Um, there are a lot of children who are affected, especially children of color in the United States. And for them, the causes. Um, maybe even more challenging because they're not the ones buying food or having the income at all. Um, <clears throat> but definitely those groups of people who tend to be lower income, the elderly, women, um, minorities in America, are also the ones who are hit most hardest by food insecurity. Valerie, how has the face of food insecurity changed at your organization at Harvesters over the years? The, the face of food insecurity has not changed significantly except in a few situations. You know, we often think of, when we think about food insecurity, we may think of people who are homeless, and, and certainly homeless people can be food insecure. But when I think about the number of homeless people served by harvesters, it's only about 4%. Uh, probably the greatest change that we are seeing is a significant increase in the number of senior citizens who are food insecure. And if you think about the fact that uh, so many people are turning 65 every day actually now, and they're, they could be on fixed incomes, but if you think about being on a fixed income, it's likely going to be less of an income than when you were working. And if you struggled with food insecurity or struggled to make ends meet, um, things aren't going to just suddenly change when you become a senior citizen. And one of the things that uh, really is concerning to us 
is that there seems to be a lack of empathy for our senior citizens uh, who are food insecure. And that's something that we as an organization and we as a community will really have to examine and see how we work our way around um, that lack of empathy and, and even apathy and make sure that we are providing for our seniors. Um, and we also know that there is a high prevalence of food insecurity among children. Whenever you look at a general food insecurity rate, uh, that food insecurity rate for children as a subgroup is going to be higher. And that really plays itself out um, across the country. And um, as Lillian said, if you are a child in a household where the numbers just don't <coughs> add up in the sense of if you're making, uh, if your household income is 16000 but it costs you 35000 to maintain a modest, stable lifestyle, then of course something has to give. And you will often find that it is t uh, families with children, uh, lots of time uh, single mothers with children, and they are just disproportionately um, represented in uh, our food insecure population to the extent that about 45% uh, of the people we serve and the people uh, serve nationally through Feeding America, children and seniors. Following up on that, Bo, as another service provider, do you see also that lack of empathy um, around food insecurity or judgment? Uh, I, I think two sides of that. And I think one of the things we've noticed at the Kansas City Community Kitchen is as we are working to create intentional community and to create opportunities to decrease stigma, we're actually watching the face of those who come change, not the face of who's food insecure. We know who that is. We have our, our research. But who's willing and able to go get help and what they're willing to go get help in. Um, back in 2012, when I was at Food Bank for New York City, we did a research study that had shown us that most of soup kitchens were male-dominated spaces and food pantries were women and children. Um, now we're finding 5 to 10% of those we serve at the Kansas City Community Kitchen are under the age of 12. Um, which is a different statistic for us. We're watching a lot more women. We're watching people come that drive up in city vehicles because they work for the city and don't make enough money. So they come to us for their lunch break now. Um, we have partners in KCK that are seeing the warehouse workers across the street walk over to cross lines and have lunch every day because they need to make it ends meet. I think what is the challenge is that we often want to paint um, the access to emergency food in this picture of extreme. Um, when we talk about the difference of what food insecurity looks like, it's easy for us to pretend it's an urban problem. It's easy for us to pretend it's a Wyandotte County problem when actually the numbers show that there are twice as many food insecure people in Johnson County than there are in Wyandotte. Now the percentage is off, like that's where we're, we keep looking at percentage, but I think the stigma work that has to be done around the importance of food that we've all kind of mentioned as that basic building block, if you're going to go to work, if you're going to go to school, if you're going to mow your yard, you can't do that if you're starving. You can't do that if you're hungry. You can't do that if you're afraid of where that next meal is going to come from. Absolutely. You said it's an urban issue. I know, Mary, um, you'll want to jump on this one. How is food insecurity the same and different in rural communities versus urban communities? Well, Lillian actually might know that better than me, but the, uh, you, you know, Rural communities have uh, lower median incomes overall, but then the cost of living is lower, so you've got to kind of factor that in. But we've done some work, and the librarians can check this, but I know that the, uh, the Interdisciplinary Center, we have a food atlas that we publish at the University of Missouri, a hunger atlas, I should say, at the University of Missouri, and um, you will see that the uh, food affordability is least, it, people are, least able to afford food in the Boot Hill and along the southern tier of Missouri, um, then places like St. Charles County, which is right outside of St. Louis. And that has to do with the fact that housing is so expensive in St. Charles County versus income. But in the lower tier of Missouri, it's that you know incomes aren't there. Uh, there might be more transient work, things like that, that are happening. Of course, that's a resource extraction area uh, um, area of Missouri. So, you know, these kinds of things all play into uh, who is food insecure and who's not. And I, and I think one thing that just shocked me, because I deal with this, but I, I work on community food systems and I work on agricultural issues and so on, 
The data out of Missouri is that I think 8% uh, of our households um, are actually hungry. Not, so we, we've got like 15 or 16% food insecurity, but 8% of that is very low food insecurity, which we used to call hunger, right? And so people are, are hungry in, this, in the state of Missouri. I don't know what the, I think Kansas is not quite there, but that, that's pretty concerning to me as a rural sociologist and I think just as a citizen of the state. Lillian, how does food insecurity affect our health, um, affect our diet? Um, that's a big question. Um, it, it has a lot of effects. Um, I mean, in the immediate sense, we've all had, you know, a day where we've gone too long without eating and we feel headachey and cranky and hangry and we don't feel like focusing. Um, so in the very immediate sense, that can... That's the main effect, and then if you imagine that happening over time. Um, but there's also a lot of diet-related diseases that can come from food insecurity. Um, you're more likely to be eating less expensive foods, which are shelf-stable, highly processed, more energy-dense, so they're not as nutritious. Um, they take less energy for our bodies to burn, so it's not as, it's not as efficient of a use of um, calories for us. So we see a lot of um, diabetes, hypertension, um, overweight and obesity, which can be counterintuitive, but is actually often a problem that goes along with food insecurity. Um, and it's difficult to tease out. Some of that is due to food insecurity. Some of it is also because of the stress level. Um, we know poverty is a huge indicator of health disparities. Um, so, but pretty much any diet-related disease you can think of, we could, we could trace back to food insecurity on some level. Valerie, what kind of food does Harvester offer, and what are the sources of your foods? Harvester's um, distributed 52 million pounds of food last year throughout our service area, and uh, about a third of that food was fresh fruits and vegetables, and that is certainly a new trend, but it is a growing trend. Um, so our food sources... And because we are a member of Feeding America, our country's largest uh, domestic hunger relief organization, we have access to national uh, food companies, producers and manufacturers. And so about a third of our food is obtained uh, through Feeding America. Um, and then what is really one of our fastest growing sources are retailers. Um, we also have relationships with many of the grocery chains, and we get a significant amount of food uh, from them. We get food donated um, by farmers and um, restaurants, um, and the federal government, actually, because we do distribute commodities uh, of, of different sorts, and we participate in different um, feeding programs. So our... Um, of our food resources in, in terms of how we acquire them or acquire it is really diverse, but what we're really seeing is a change in that inventory of what we have available. And it's not just harvesters, but it is really um, a trend nationwide. Food banking is about 40 years old, and it was started um, by business and religious leaders who saw a lot of food going to waste, and this was happening across the country. And manufacturers determined that we would be happy to, to give you this food, but we only want to deal with one entity or, you know, in a city or, or from a national perspective. <coughs> so it was stuff like, you know, if the yellow cake was orange, you, you know, Duncan Hines couldn't sell it, so they'd give it to the food bank. And it was... Um, you know, the thought that anything is better than nothing and why let it go to waste when someone can use it. And, and certainly that uh, was a very noble undertaking. But as in much else, when you know better, you do better. And so we built a network around basically shelf-stable food. And now, because manufacturers are getting so much more efficient and they actually have a zero waste goal, um, Chef Stable and particularly canned goods in terms of donations have stagnated. 
But then, you know, while, while that's going on, on the other hand, we're beginning to realize that so much of our food goes to waste, certainly from the retail and the consumer perspective, but then we realize so much food that is grown never gets harvested. It winds up being um, tilled over. And so now we have relationships with farmers and uh, different organizations that are gleaners where they'll go into the field and get that food that isn't uh, sellable. And it's only because it's not perfect in the sense of the aesthetics. You know, it's not a number two potato. And unless it's a number two potato, the machines, the, the manufacturer's machines aren't set up to cut them into french fries. And, and so we get the heart-shaped potatoes or the, you know, or the carrots like you've never seen before. Um, the nutritional value is there. And so we see that right now as the most readily available, most nutritious food source that we have. But it also means that we have to retool our system so that we are able to accommodate more perishable food. Right, right. Bo, what's your experience when you think about what kinds of foods are being offered through Nourish KC? I think the struggle is, uh, to Valerie's point, is that we're in an evolving system where the um, something was good enough mentality is still hanging on a little bit, like systemically. Um, we see that when we do community food drives, that idea of just grabbing that cheapest can of green beans with the highest sodium ever, um, and putting that in a cart, thinking, well, I gave something today, you should be grateful. And I think what we talk a lot about at Nourish KC and with our partners through our Hunger Summit initiatives and um, in, in the work that we do is really about how do we change that narrative and how do we make it so that the fresh choice and the healthy choice is the only choice and how do we teach people to understand what that weird heart-shaped potato is. Um, in my previous role, um, we had kids come in and had never seen a raw potato because they're used to French fries. They're used to mashed potatoes. We've lost the art of generational farming. We've lost, or we're losing, we haven't lost, we're losing the art of how to know what produce is and how to handle it. And one of the stressors in that system with great programs like Double Up Food Bucks, which allow people to go buy more fresh local produce, is that in our system, sometimes they're getting such odd looking produce that they can't go to the store and buy it because they still don't understand what it is. And so one of the big things when we talk about food rescue, which is amazing, we get about 750,000 pounds of food rescue a year just from, the two, from two of the Whole Foods here in town. Um, being able to use that product in a way that people can understand it and then learn how to use it at home and use it so that when they have financial resources, SNAP, WIC, whatever that may be, that they're able to buy that product on their own, finding the good deals, finding how to handle it, how to handle that high sodium product, so that it becomes something they can teach generationally. Well, I think that's an important point because the, we've set up a system where we're getting this food waste. There's still a lot of food that's wasted, of course. We, at one point, this was about 10 years ago, about 3,800 calories were produced for every man, woman, and child in the U.S., and you waste about 1,000 of those calories. So you can see that there's a big problem. There's 1,000 calories wasted, and there's still too much being eaten, right? So that, that's a big problem. But... Farmers, you know, don't want to waste stuff because that means it's, you know, money that they don't get. Uh, food manufacturers don't want to waste stuff because they're all about the bottom line, right? So as we are better about not wasting food um, and we change the system, it's that dynamic part of it. So I like what Bo said about having to really think about the resources like SNAP that can help people buy food, the kinds of foods they want to buy, when they want it, and so on. I think those things, those kinds of resources are absolutely critical if we're gonna address food insecurity. I mean, the emergency system is amazing, and I'm really excited about the kinds of um, different, or changes that you guys have made in, in the food banking system. It's absolutely incredible what's been happening, but I really don't think that that's the system anybody really wants. I mean, we, that's not the system we're, we're really ecstatic about. We've got to make sure that people can buy food on their own. And that means that we're going to have to think about, you know, wages and income, access, all of those kinds of things. To, to, to mention another surprising aspect of how income plays into this, um, just as part of my research, um, I've 
worked on a large project where we interviewed about 120 low-income women in North Carolina, rural and urban, with, with young kids, and we tracked them for five years. And one of the things we did was uh, spend a lot of time in their homes cooking with them, going grocery shopping, going to the food pantries. Um, and, and something that surprised me very much was um, the, the kitchen resources. So there were a lot of people who lived in very small trailers, who didn't have counter space, who didn't have cutting boards and knives and measuring cups and things that I very much take for granted. Um, for example, we did dietary recalls and we, we brought measuring cups with us and to ask them to say, well, how much of the serving do you have? And um, it, and they ended up saying like, wow, these are really nice. We ended up giving them, they were dollar measuring cups from the dollar store um, that they just, you know, they, they didn't have the resources to cook the things. And it's not that they didn't know how to, um, but they didn't have the space or the, um, you know, someone even talk about, well, I have to, you know, do all my cooking very quickly because I can't have the gas running for too long or the electricity bill will be too high, whatever the reason. So. It was a surprising way that um, I found that income played into food insecurity that I didn't that I wouldn't have considered before I did that research. So it just made me think of it. And the households, I mean, I think that part part of the time we think, well, why you know a dollar for measuring cups or something like that, right? But but people have a lot of transient housing situations too, right? So they're they're not always you know they might lose their belongings in an eviction, and that's income related, right? Um, and then once you got one eviction on you, who's going to rent to you, right? So I mean, you've got all these issues that pile up against you. So when we start to talk about this food insecurity, it's a it's a food system issue, but then it's this other arena of, of societal issues about who has money and, and wealth and resources. But Mary, we're saying food system a lot. What is a food system? Well, when I think about food systems, it's everything that it takes to grow, um, process, pick, process, distribute, um, retail, eat, and then what's left over, the waste, right? And, and of course, in agriculture, nothing's a waste because it all goes back somewhere, right? Um, and so when you leave something on the field, actually, that can be really good for the soil. And that's one thing we're finding out, that we need to pay more attention to soil issues because that's a productivity issue. I mean, we, we want to address food security now, and in the future. So we've got to think about the natural resources that we're using. So when I think about food system, it's all of that. That's in it, you know, the, all of those things we're talking about. So we're talking about grocery stores, and we're talking about farm workers, and we're talking about a global system, by the way, because we're entering the season where most of our <laughs> produce is not coming from the United States, right? And pretty soon it'll start coming from uh, um, Mexico or s further south, generally. And sometimes Arizona. I mean, there, there, there is Arizona, New Mexico producing a lot of our winter vegetables. But you know, we're entering that season. It's a global system. I think just to add to that, I think one of the things that's really important about that systems approach is that often we like to play our own hunger games, where we, like in the farm bill, compete farmers versus those who are food insecure. And we like to say, fight it out. And we like to say, you know, farmers aren't making income to be able to take care of themselves. So they're in the bread line along with everybody else. And we have to get out of that mentality. We have to look at our food system that the whole ship has to raise in order to address this issue. Um, production's a problem, you know, gleaning and gathering and, and manufacturing and distribution, that if we don't look at it systemically from the balcony, from that 30,000 foot view, we are never gonna be able to solve any part of the food system issue, whether that's um, creating sustainable agriculture, whether that's creating workforce development around the ag industry, um, but also how we get our product um, and what happens to it after. You know, we make a commitment to compost. Um, so when we rescue food, we're composting it or sending it out to pigs or doing whatever we can do to make sure that we're doing the best we can with what we have when we have it. Um, so you went to the farm bill. So we're now into policy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, let's talk about the role. Let's start with the uh, federal government and federal policy. You spoke to the farm bill. And we have the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm going to go to Mary, and then I'm going to go to Valerie on this one. So first, tell me a little bit more about the USDA, and tell me about the flagship bills like the Farm Bill or Child Nutrition Act that have such meaningful, huge impact on our entire food system and our access to food. So the USDA, everybody says, oh, it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but actually uh, Food and Nutrition Services uh, 
took up the bulk of the last farm bill, actually. Um, at one point, 75% of the farm bill and 75% of the resources we were spending in food and agriculture were actually going to uh, uh, SNAP and food assistance programs, okay? So that's, that's gone down now. I think we're back down to around 65%, but don't quote me on that. Maybe the librarians will know that, but um, I think we're back down to that. Um, but the Farm Bill covers things like the, the biggest parts of the Farm Bill and thus of USDA, the biggest parts are um, the, food, the nutri Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP as we've been calling it, um, which is food assistance, but there's other programs that roll, rolled into that that Valerie might talk about. Then we have um, so-called commodity programs, but primarily that's in the credit. We have conservation programs, which are paying for um, farmers to do more uh, conservation-minded agriculture. Um, those are really the three biggest, uh, um, the credit, the commodity, the conservation, and the, and the food and nutrition services are the, are the big parts of the, of the farm bill. And that's coming up. We're supposed to have a farm bill, a new one. Generally, we do these about five, every five years. Sometimes it's six, sometimes it's, I don't know, but they, um, are planning, I just read an uh, article in the Agricultural Press this morning that they're, they believe at the, at the House side anyway, that they're planning to get a farm bill out by September of 2018. And you can, you, you know why, because <laughs> you know what happens in November. Um, but uh, that's what they're hoping for. So there's a lot of ways to get involved. And there's a lot of tensions, as Bo mentioned, right now between the nutrition side and and the farm side. And not all of this is about farmers and nutrition folks. In fact, a lot of it is, and a lot of it's about um, people that are, are have different visions of, of the way money should be spent in the federal government in general, right? And uh, uh, that's creating a lot of tension because generally the farm groups have been on board with the nutrition programs and vice versa. But that there's outside interests that now are, you know, kind, that used to be in public, policy, they called it kind of the, I think the Iron Triangle or something like that. It was the triangle that never to be broken, USDA and the farm groups and the nutrition groups. Um, and we'll see how that plays out now in the 2018 Farm Bill because we've seen some, some issues. But, you know, we've, we've also seen some very innovative programs through USDA, like the Double Up Food Bucks program that's happening right here in uh, Kansas and Missouri. Great, it's a win-win. It's like farmers like have more markets because people can come use their SNAP um, dollars at the market. That's something we didn't used to be able to do 10 years ago, now we can do that. But now we even double it, right? If you come with $10 in SNAP, you get $20 to buy on fresh produce. And we know from some early work that the, those are really good interventions that people start to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. I mean, really. Farmer's market's a great place. I mean, you've got really good fruits, fruits and vegetables there. So everybody should be able to get to it. We're gonna go, let me ask one more question and then we'll turn to you. I wanna follow up on this again on the farm bill because I know that we're looking at um, nearly a 21, if we look at President Trump's budget, we're looking at nearly a 21% cut to the USDA. And I'm curious what that means for harvesters. Um, you know, first I would like to say <coughs> that harvesters and um, the, the, the Greater Feeding America network of food banks, we are not adversaries with the federal government. If I were to line 20 bags of groceries here as it relates to food assistance, 19 of those bags would be filled by um, our federal nutrition programs. And so... Um, the rest, which last year was over 4 billion pounds of food provided through um, our network of food banks across the country, that only uh, represents 5%. And so what that means is that anything that does harm, as in reduces the federal nutrition programs, will definitely create increased need on the part of charities that also provide um, food assistance. And it is, it is literally something that would stretch us to the breaking point because the resources just are not there. But what I will say is that we partner um, with USDA. 
We do distribute commodities. Um, we take advantage of, of all of the child nutrition feeding programs. They are a, a staple in terms of what we provide. But if I were to do a heat map in terms of the programs that we provide, how much does it cost us to distribute a meal? And we do SNAP outreach. SNAP outreach is the least expensive way for us to provide a meal. Um, and then, of course, general food banking. But, and, and, and so what I will say is that it is extremely important that uh, we ensure that we do no harm to those federal um, feeding programs because if they go away or if they are diminished, we will see our food insecurity numbers and our hunger numbers go up to levels that would um, truly be detrimental to the individuals who are food insecure, but to the overall health of our community because of the impact and the consequences of food insecurity. And the economic health, because all those SNAP dollars that are spent, that's multiplied right there in the community right away. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of benefits, not just to health, but also to the economic health. And I'll, I'll just add one more thing, and, and that is really about partnerships and collaboration. We, uh, this year in particular, have partnered with the uh, Kansas Farm Bureau, uh, and it's really to create awareness how, how the uh, nutrition programs and the farm programs are so important to the community. One benefits the other, and so uh, to separate them would, would certainly, again, be detrimental to the community's health and to farm health. I'm going to stop only. We'll start up with you, but I know we have some questions from our audience, and so go ahead. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, we do. We, we're getting a number of questions, and I just wanted to encourage the audience to keep the questions coming. And if you have a question, please raise your hand, and somebody will come by and pick up your card. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> questions are good. Anyway, um, uh, this first question is um, about recent research that indicates that the classic food pyramid is wrong and promoting a high, uh, a high carb, low fat diet causes insulin resistance and obesity. How can you promote a good diet if you rely on industry leftovers? Uh, okay. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> I will start by saying that I am not a nutritionist, and so it's difficult for me to speak very specifically about that uh, idea, of that recent research. What I will say as a researcher, as a scientist, is that uh, it's constantly changing, and we, we don't know, and almost my job as a scientist is to keep proving myself wrong over and over. And so I think it's a really big challenge when we're talking about food insecurity because we constantly have new information about nutrition, and we're finding that um, now you should eat lots of carbs, and now you shouldn't eat carbs. Um, and I think, ultimately, what my takeaway from that is, is that um, we're trying really hard to come up with a one-size-fits-all generalized answer, and I think that there isn't one. And I think that there's a lot of things that go into that equa equation, like genetics, and metabolism, and your environment, and stress levels, and your race, and ethnicity, and, and gender. And so I, I caution against um, relying too heavily on that and kind of just remembering that it is constantly changing, it is different for everybody. Um, and, you know, and the, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And, you know, there is something to be said for fed is best. But. And I think it's really about making sure you understand the product that's coming. And so when we rescue, 40% of what we rescue right now is grain. Um, and, or a product, a, a bread product. And so if we're looking at what that does and we look at my plate or we look at other things, we just have to be aware and we have to just make sure that the easy choice isn't the only choice we consider, which, um, you know, we have some of our partners that have giant walls full of bread and people can take as much bread as they want because they believe in the philosophy of a uh, full stomach's better than an empty stomach. And, and I actually disagree. I think um, there are things that we don't know, depending on the genetics, depending on the circumstances. 
But I think we have to be better about one, um, leveraging rescued food to, so that we don't have to buy everything, but using our dollars strategically. I think the other part we need to push in or lean in on is when we do community events that gather food, we need to do a better job of educating the general public of what to bring. Um, it's easy for us to dig into that counter and grab that expired can of sardines. No, thank you. <laughs> keep it. Like literally keep it. I don't want it. So give me stuff that we can do and we need to do a better job of holding ourselves accountable to that and saying, yes, rescued's awesome, but we need to lead that charge. So we're, we're getting lots and lots of great questions. So uh, we'll keep firing away here. We talk about food deserts. What about the people who don't know how to prepare food, even if it's available? Right. Oh, I can speak to that. You know, that's, that, that sometimes uh, clearly can be an issue. And particularly for us, because there have been times when we get something into our food bank and I'm not quite sure what it is or <laughs> what I would do with it. Um, and, but that's really where education comes into play. And that is something that we're very heavily into in terms of nutrition education. Um, Harvesters has, has recently kind of changed our focus and we are really embedding ourselves into our pantries so we can help really using some of the science that grocery stores use. How do we make the healthy choice the easy choice in terms of how do we position, uh, how do we lay out our food pantries? Uh, how do we label the food that is in the food pantry? Providing recipes, providing taste testing, just like they do in the grocery store, making sure that those recipes are simple and fast. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're all very stressed for time. And, you know, if you put some of those other burdens of maybe having to take public transportation or make a couple stops, you know, I, I take the bus from work to the daycare and then home, by the time you get home, how much energy and time is left. So, so it's, let, let's make it easy, you know, and that most nutritionists will tell you the less you do with it, the, the closer to its natural state that you can keep a whole food, the more nutritious it is. So, so it really becomes awareness. Uh, awareness in terms of what does good nutrition mean to me in terms of my health and the health of my family, and how can I make the nutritious choice the easy choice? And I would also say, though, I mean, some like I look at my well-off college students that aren't, you know, I've certainly got college students that are food insecure, but I also have those that aren't. And the ones that aren't also don't know how to cook, right? They also don't know how to do anything in the kitchen um, sometimes. I mean, it's just a matter of kind of individual and household things. So sometimes I think we get into this place where we say, oh, they don't know how to cook, or they don't know this, or they don't, you know? And it's like, well, I don't know what to do with, uh, what, I can't even pronounce it, J-I-C-A-M-A. Hickama, right? I don't even know what to do with that. Am I uneducated? Do I not know how to cook? Blah, 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 right? So I think we've got to, we've got to think about those kinds of things because we make a lot of assumptions. And I know the, the study that Lillian was involved in, I didn't know you were involved in that. That's a, that was a cool, cool study, by the way. Um, they, they found out some of those things, right? So we can't make blanket assumptions about what people do and don't know. And what are the life circumstances and so on. So we, you know, education is part of it, but we really got to talk about the structure of why do some people have no money and why do some people have too much money? I mean, really, I, I, let me just be frank. So uh, on that. Do we have another question? <laughs> we do. Yes, we do. I'm back here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm roving. Um, this question, isn't poverty slash low incomes the most significant problem causing food insecurity? And since poor health, poor education, poor housing, et cetera, are too, sorry, shouldn't this be the focus as the real problem? And this panel is addressing a symptom and not the root causes. I, I, 
I think that's a great point, and I, I think that uh, in my work, I spend a lot of time saying it's household resources that matter. Um, I think, though, that a good thing about food insecurity, as this gets quote just taken out of context, is that there's a lot of points of intervention. Mm -hmm. And so while there is a large, large, perhaps larger underlying problem of poverty and household insecurity and income inequality, we're struggling to fix this problem. That's an even bigger one. So I think using any point of intervention where there is an opportunity for change and there are good things happening and great work going on is something we should take advantage of. Um, yeah. You know, it, it brings me to kind of where we are in, in the evolution of harvesters. Our mission is to feed hungry people today and to work to end hunger tomorrow. And we've done a really great job of feeding people today, but somehow that second half of the mission got lost until very recently, I would say in the last few years. And you know, it's not just something with harvesters, but I think you see many more nonprofits understanding that we are addressing symptoms um, and we avoid those root causes. And, and, and it is a very daunting situation to try to address those root causes, but sometimes you have to look out into the future and, and determine where is it that we want to take this. If we want to end hunger, we can't assume that we can end it overnight, mm -hmm. but if, if, if we give ourselves a runway. Uh, and, and so now you see a lot more collaboration, a lot more collaboration with nonprofits who provide those services that will help people um, become more stable economically, whether it's through education, whether it's through drop, job training, um, whether it's through providing housing assistance while you go through that job training. You know, people who have uh, unstable lives economically know what they need. Um, and if we can provide some sustained assistance so that they can take themselves from one level to the other, they are much more likely to be able to sustain themselves at a point where food assistance won't be required, where some of that other assistance won't be required. But it isn't an overnight change, and it has to be a concerted effort with shared outcomes that different organizations are willing to come together and work with people for an extended period of time. And I think then we will begin to see some changes. But you know, then you can always talk about low wages, uh, living wage, and, and, and a lot of this are the debates that we're having. You know, do, do we wanna skirt around some of these other issues? But, but then I have to back us up and I have to say, we are going to advocate. There are certain things that we're going to advocate for. Um, there are collaborations that we are going to try to be a part of and even to convene, but we do food. And we do food well, and that's our expertise. And so we have to work with entities that do the other thing. Uh, because if we spread ourselves too thin, we won't be good at anything. And, and our resources are, are the resources that we have. But, but, but I think it's, you, you know, it's, it's absolutely right. We, we have to do things in a more um, defined and definite manner and not be so disjointed. And, and I don't think, you know, I, I, I'm not criticizing my own organization. I'm not criticizing any organization because you find a need and you address it, but you're walking down that path alone so often and you need to have company. But the, the you know, the tax, pol you know, we're talking about tax reform bills and this is outside of my area of expertise, but I do know the tax policy has an impact on income, right? And, and how, you know, we tax wealth at a much lower rate than we tax income, for instance. So, you know, let's just tell people that are working, um, working poor, trying to get food, 
um, you know, you should have wealth because it would be a lot cheaper of your tax bill. But let's, we could, we could do things like earned income tax credit. We could think about some of the, those things actually go right back into the community with, uh, with spending, and it's a good economic development alternative. And I'm really interested in food systems as economic development drivers, and I'm particularly interested in this in terms of um, in rural areas. And so we see those happening in informal ways and formal economic ways. So I think those things can all be part of, uh, of our conversation, but it's tax policy, it's about um, SNAP nutrition assistance that is actually where you can actually spend the money, not just per perhaps we give you what we think you want. I, people are strategic. They will know how to use these pr uh, programs, if that's what Valerie was saying, if they're available. And so those are all ways to address poverty. I mean, SNAP is a, is a way to, it's a poverty alleviation program. But it also, isn't there an opportunity for skill building? for jobs, I mean, think about new farmers, um, urban farmers, we certainly see a lot of that in Kansas City. Uh, that's an opportunity for increasing income and addressing poverty. I also think something to, that I always like to look at is the fact that for $50 <coughs> in emergency food, I could do a whole lot more than $50 towards your rent. That I can spread my resources differently. So, although we're, we are we ally ourselves with EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, with the Benefit Cliff and child care subsidies and Medicaid and Medicare and uh, employment and transportation and workforce development, we also have to be looking at where can we leverage the resources in the most efficient way for the best return on investment. And I think emergency food is a great investment into our infrastructure. Um, SNAP is the ultimate. We want people to go buy their own food and to leverage that. Double up food bucks makes that even better. But the fact that harvesters, because of their work and with partnering with After the Harvest to glean from, from our produce and dealing with food rescue, we're able to do more with a lot less. So although this may not be the issue that solves all issues, it's an issue that we can at least make ground on to give people some hope that we can fix housing, that we can fix employment and living wages, that we can fix all these other issues, but let's make sure they're fed first and let's make sure that they're fed healthy and well so that they can live to see these fixes and that they can go to work and actually work that living wage job um, because they're not empty in their stomach. Uh, this next question, <clears throat> we have a group of uh, high school students with us here this evening. And uh, this is what I think is a very good question from among that group. Why are junk foods selling at 50 cents to $1.25 yet our vegetables are $5 or more? Does this have an effect on food insecurity? People? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you know, one, one of our biggest issues is that People who are food insecure um, often have to make choices, and, and, and just like the student shared, they often have to go for the inexpensive choice because they're after bulk. I'm, I'm going to fill my stomach. And, and so when the inexpensive choice is the unhealthy choice, then we just get into that cycle of food insecurity and poor food choices and uh, poor health related to diet. And, and, and so that is one of the things really that we try to work against. Um, you can have tasty, inexpensive meals. You just have to know how to prepare them. Um, and, and so we work really hard but it is an uphill battle, uh, you, you know, and I'm guilty. <laughs> I've had many a Snickers for lunch. <laughs> Lillian, you, in some of your research, you looked at what were some of the purchasing strategies of families in food desert communities. Can you speak to that? It's a big question. Um, but yes, um, we do find in lots of research that less nutritious option, options tend to be less expensive and more readily available. A lot of this is because they're shelf stable, um, so a store can stock it for a really long time and not worry about it rotting on the shelf if nobody buys it. Um, in schools in particular, this is a challenge because there tends to be a higher profit margin on those uh, snack foods and junk food items. So 
there, there's an incentive for schools to sell them, even though it may not be in the best interest of the students. Um, <clears throat> and I think this also goes back to the farm bill. Um, you mentioned there are three main parts of it. That commodity portion involves um, the ways in which we subsidize different uh, crops in the United States. The vast majority of those subsidies go towards grain products. There's a lot of reasons for that. You know, there's, there's only a couple of grain products. There's lots of fruits and vegetables. There tends to be a more concentration of grain producers than fruit and vegetable producers. They're more scattered. Um, so for that reason, it, these, these foods are cheaper. Um, so it's cheaper to make them, it's cheaper to produce them, it's cheaper to grow them, and uh, then you can sell them for less and still profit more. Um, and absolutely, in the work that I've done, um, you know, when you're trying to feed your family for a month on a limited budget, you are absolutely thinking about how many calories can I bring into the house for how little money. But grain, I mean, pound for pound, uh, or uh, dollar for calorie, grain is always going to be cheaper. I mean, that's just the way it is. Because grains are high yielding. I mean, that's what human civilization is built based on, is uh, it's a grain civilization. Um, and it, it is, they take less, I mean, not every vegetable takes really, really high quality soil, but most of them do. So they're what we call heavy nutrient feeders, right? So they want a lot of nitrogen, a lot of different kinds of things like that. So um, grains are they're storable. There's a lot of reasons why things like grains um, and, and sugars and so on are, are uh, cheaper. They're not all related to subsidies. In fact, we have changed in the 2008 Farm Bill most direct payments. I, I think it was in the 08 Farm Bill most direct payments to farmers were phased out. We still have a lot of uh, support for pro what we call program crops, which are corn, wheat, oil, seeds, sugar, uh, cotton, things like that, through the um, risk management side, which is the uh, crop insurance and so on. But, but still, I mean, grains, we're not going to, you can't go to North Missouri and, and put out a field of broccoli. It, you can't. There's not water. There's not the soil's not there. We can grow. We can do pretty well with extensive grazing in North Missouri and and treat the soil well, right? So I mean, e we have to think about this ecologically as well. We are part of an ecological system. We try to forget that, but we're part of an ecological system, and so that also contributes to why some foods, you know, it's political, it's ecological, it's economic. Why some foods are cheaper than other foods. Um, but I don't want to knock grains completely um, because they are, again, that's, that's what got us through times of famine as a human civilization. And so vegetables and fruits are really important, but they're, they're perishable, so they cost more just because you lose more. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into this. But if we, go ahead. I'll just follow up with an example. I, I, I agree, definitely. And so but even thinking within produce, in North Carolina, where I work and live, for example, um, there's a lot of great initiatives with farm to school programs where local farmers sell to, to schools um, for their school lunch program. But just for example, in the county that I work, it costs six cents for a serving of applesauce, and it costs 60 cents for a serving of fresh apple slices. So even there, you're talking about a tenfold increase in the price for something that is more nutritious. It doesn't have added sugars. It may not have added preservatives. But it's not shelf stable. It's a lot harder to um, standardize a serving from kid to kid. Um, and so it's, it's a tall order to ask schools who are struggling to say, OK, can you pay 10 times as much? I mean, 60 cents may not seem like a lot for one kid, but over the course of the day. So it's not just grains, definitely. I, I know in Kansas City we're spending a lot of time on trying to build up a healthy, robust local food system. So uh, local foods often, especially fresh local foods, often cost more. Bo, can you speak to why that is the case? I think I can, from a perspective, and I'm sure that there are other people that know more than I do from, from reality, um, I think in the conversations we have with um, the community that's here local, whether that's Fresh Farm HQ, KC Healthy Kids, Cultivate Kansas City, you know, people that are uh, leading the way in how we can um, up our production here, I think part of it is um, the landscape, what we have around us, what's available, what we know, what big ag owns versus what we own. Um, I think also seasonality is a big issue here, and I know it's something we're working on. There's a lot of greenhouse work happening. There's a lot of conversations about aquaponics here in Kansas City. 
Um, I think that's one of our biggest issues is that we get, we have seasons in Missouri, if you didn't know this. Um, and so, you know, that causes some real problems for us. I think we also have um, issues with workforce that we don't necessarily have the people that can go in. And I know there's a lot of initiatives about how do we increase people that are educated enough to come and work on a farm. Farming is not gardening. Well, even gardening in your backyard isn't what it used to be for my, my grandparents, where it was just you had fun out in the garden. No, the science that you have to know about soil, about um, nutrients, about drainage is, is incredible. And we don't have a workforce that understands that and is willing to go get dirty in a farm sometimes. And those are two hard parts. And the, and the workforce, I mean, frankly, food's too cheap in that sense. Because if you think about who, like I said, um, California, you know, a lot of farm workers out there not making uh, very much money, um, uh, transient often, right? Um, down in Immokalee, Florida, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers just asked for a penny a pound more for for uh, tomatoes that, that Taco Bell and places like that were buying. And... That just allowed them to actually put food on the table. You know, these kinds of things are are really important. We have an immigration debate in agriculture right now because, you know, a lot of people rely, a lot of our farmers rely on immigration, and part of that is it's cheaper. And they're skilled, they're very, very skilled people that are doing this agricultural work, and we don't have, have those same kinds of skills. But I would also say that, you know, we used to be a huge tomato producing state down in uh, southwest Missouri. We had a ton of tomatoes. We had a lot of strawberries right here, I think, in the going out to the, the Caw Valley and so on. Um, why don't we? Well, they laser leveled a bunch of California land and they've got federal subsidies for irrigation. So we talk about grains being subsidized, but we don't talk about vegetables, right? Uh, fruits and vegetables. And so there are, there, there are a lot of those intricacies that we've built a system that looks this way. And we have to rethink how we're going to change it. And again, like Valerie said, none of this happens overnight. And there are steps that we can take, but we, we kind of have to think about all those moving pieces all at once, at the household level, at the farm level, at the grocery level. Um, all of those things uh, go into this. And it makes it really complex. And so my students are like, oh my gosh, right? But I'm like, no, this means that there's all kinds of cool stuff to do as a student in agriculture and food. There's all kinds of opportunities to be creative and innovative and all those things. So I, I also think that's important to acknowledge, right? I mean, you're doing this now, right? And it's fun and you're having fun with it. So there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of opportunities. Valerie. But, but again, it also goes back to uh, being purposeful. We do have a lot of small farms here, but if you look at economy of scale, something coming from a small farm is going to cost you more than something coming from a big conglomerate. But I'm so happy to see that the farm to table movement, you know, in, in this area, this region, it is here to stay. And you have restaurants who are committing to our small farmers. Um, I visited a farm um, over the summer right outside of Lawrence and I sat in the most beautiful John Deere tractor with Bose uh, speakers and, <laughs> and computers that, I mean, it's, it's not what it once was, you know, but this young farmer, uh, so not only did he manage his farm, but then he jumped in the truck to deliver the produce, and, and, and so it is a never-ending job, and it's not something that a lot of young people are attracted to, but, but, but I just have to give kudos um, to our, our chefs and our restaurant owners who are committed to that table, that, that farm-to-table movement, and you know, all you have to do is sit down to dinner and, and you, see the, you see the difference. You know, they say once upon a time, not only did you know what you were eating, but you knew who grew it. And, uh, you, you know, we, we've just gotten so far away from that, but I think we, we see things coming back. People want that intimacy again, and, and certainly you want that intimacy with your food. Um, and so how, how, how can we make a difference um, patronize those um, 
those entities that are committed to doing what we think are the right things in order to grow our own farm economy. Here's a related question. Who holds grocery stores uh, that sell substandard food, particularly fruits and vegetables, accountable for what they sell? And how do we fix it? I guess my first just initial thought is, um, let's talk about the ugly fruit movement or ugly food movement. Like, what makes it substandard? Is it that it's not pretty? Um, and I think we need to question that first to understand that question further. I think that we want our produce to be shiny and beautiful, um, which increase the costs and increase a lot of burden. I think that um, we just need to get better <coughs> at understanding what produce actually looks like from the earth and how we deal with that. And I think that that would be where I would want to start that conversation. And I, I think there's other people that probably have some, a different angle to take, but. So everything that is sold um, meets food, stan uh, food safety standards. Um, I, you know, we can have a discussion about those food safety standards, but I, I personally don't have any problems buying uh, food at uh, a grocery store in the United States. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna be uh, safe enough food. So I, I'm not sure about the accountability. I mean, consu consumers hold folks, uh, hold grocery stores accountable. Um, but I will also say that the grocery industry is extremely consolidated. About a third of the grocery, not quite, about 30% of the groceries um, that we buy in the United States move through Walmart. And um, about 55% of the groceries move through one of four stores, including Walmart. So um, we really, it's hard for small markets and rural areas to um, to get up and going in that kind of competitive market arena, um, especially because as the grocery industry consolidated, so did the distribution industry. So if you're in my hometown of Shickley, Nebraska, population 360 people that's, that just now reopened a grocery store, I mean, how are you gonna come up with $10,000 minimum orders every week? I mean, these things are really problematic in rural areas, but they're also problematic in urban areas, small neighborhood stores and things like that. I mean, the best food actually goes to the suburbs generally, right? So, uh, or it goes to wealthy neighborhoods, wherever that is. So those are, those are all things that kind of play into that whole grocery store question too. But, you know, I think grocers in general are very, you know, they, they don't want they don't want a reputation of selling substandard stuff. <laughs> they don't, you know, they're not interested in that. They, they're interested in maintaining themselves. Go ahead, next question. Go ahead, next question. People of certain ethnicities, uh, Africans, Asians, Middle Eastern people, as an example, sometimes must travel long distances to get to a grocery store that sells the ingredients they need to make the food they are used to eating in their home countries. Is this a form of food insecurity? Uh, they have grocery stores close by, but they don't sell the ingredients they need. Yeah, it's absolutely a form of food insecurity, not being able to access or afford the food you prefer. Um, I think, I guess I'll just give a grain of hope in that. Um, and I mentioned the work I do and we tracked the same families for a five year period. In year one, we heard a lot of that, especially from the Latino women that we interviewed that they had to travel very far to get to grocery stores that sold Hispanic items, um, that they cost more money. By the end of year four, we were hearing that Walmart sold those items cheaper, that they could find them in Food Lion. I don't know if y'all have that here, but it's our main grocery store or one of our main grocery stores. So at least in, within the community in which I work, um, grocers were responding to that demand and were pro offering more of those items, at least for the Latino, Latino community, which is rapidly growing in North Carolina. Um, it's definitely still a problem and definitely uh, d qualifies as, as a part of food insecurity. Um, interestingly, where I was, the cultural relevance of food was important also to African-American participants and white rural Southern participants. It's just that the foods that they associated with their culture were readily available at the grocery store. So it was not something they had to search for. And what you're saying is culturally appropriate food is definitely part of food security. 
I think just to add to that, because it's a thing we don't talk about as much, um, but there are organizations like Food Equality Initiative here in Kansas City that's talking about um, allergy, food allergy friendly product, um, stuff that is gluten free. But we're also talking about, um, you know, that's a big piece of that. I think that we're missing often in our, in our conversations is that access to food that we need um, both culturally, but also for our health um, is, is I think also an issue. Yeah, and so you can imagine um the hurdles in terms of providing culturally uh, appropriate or, you know, those foods that are appropriate for different segments of the community. It is certainly probably one of our biggest challenges, but I would say, um, again, just having that awareness so that you can give your best effort in terms of meeting the individual needs of a community I, I think that's something that um, most grocers will respond to, particularly your larger chains. If 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 they if, if it's a market, they will respond to it. When we think about the food system, we're talking about some of these changes that we would um, like to see happen. I'm curious, how do we bring the community? How do we bring residents in to those conversations so that this is not such a top-down strategy? but one that really engages the people who are living in neighborhoods and lifting up their voices. Um, I'll just speak from Nourish KC's angle. One of the big things that we started in 2016 were uh, a movement of hunger summits throughout the city. We divided the city into uh, micro regions um, based on how our city is divided, like north of the river versus midtown versus Wyandotte, uh, Olathe versus Overland Park to talk about what it means to address food security. And in the next phase of that, it, we started with um, those who are touching food. And so we started with food pantries, with harvesters after the harvest, ones that we can get used to each other, because once you open up that can and you invite people in, we need to be ready for it. And most often we're not. And I think often we jump to going into the public and asking opinions, but we have no ability to help. Um, and so now our next phase as we move into 2018 is that we're actually going grassroots and doing more community forums and town halls um, and then figuring out ways that are more authentic than what we would consider from a, an overeducated upper middle class perspective instead looking like how do we get people's authentic voice so at the kansas city community kitchen we do surveys we're actually going to uh, experiment with putting a dry erase board in the bathroom and asking a question a day and saying hey while you're in this room while you're here and you feel safe like answer this question for us we're sure it'll be entertaining but we're hoping it gives us some good information and and looking at how do we actually engage people in an authentic place that in, uh, amplifies their voice rather than minimizes their voice. You know, the Oregon Food Bank has done some really interesting work. Um, they have a program they call FEAST, which uh, I think stands for Food, Education, Agriculture, Sustaining Together, something like that. But it's, uh, they, they do this in rural areas um, primarily where they bring together uh, uh, consumers, food pantries, uh, food pantry recipients, farmers, uh, business leaders, decision makers, all kinds of people to talk about what the food system looks like in their place and what are the issues with it and how can they improve it, right? So you've got farmers uh, figuring <coughs> out what they could do to contribute to, to solutions. I think it's solutions together, food, education, agriculture, solutions together. Um, and those kinds of things start with a meal right? Because that's what you guys do too, right? Um, it starts with a meal because sharing food is really, really important and, and starting to build that community. And I think sometimes we just want to rush in and ask these questions like Bo was saying, but, but we don't do the time to build the trust that we have to do together. Um, and so I think that model is very promising and it's a community organizing strategy, right? Just like any problem, um, can be solved better together, I think. Um, uh, I think food insecurity is one of those things. I think um, an important way to help build that trust is really listening to the responses, like Bo said, being ready to respond. And a lot of times working in the community, that means doing something I don't necessarily agree with. And I think being open to that and willing to do that is really important, or an important part of inviting people to be part of the conversation. I have spent a lot of time researching and learning and I know a lot about food insecurity. I know nothing about what it means to be food insecure. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. And that's, um, I, I think it, it, inviting people to participate and be part of it is, is the first of two really important steps. And the second is listening. And if the community members say, we want a conventional grocery store that serves Velveeta and pork rinds, then that's what I feel my job is then to provide them. Especially as a starting place, I yes. think, too. It's meeting people where they are. Yeah. We may have this vision of farm to table, everyone's eating, you know, everyone's vegetarian or whatever. I, I think the reality is we have to meet people where they are and then do small winnable victories that meet people in a place that isn't threatening. And that's hard. It's hard to do when you are a part, if you're living in extreme poverty, a part of a community that maybe has been pushed aside and there is no trust because they're, we've destroyed trust in those communities uh, of, of multiple demographics. How do we engage youth? We're talking about different populations here, but the youth voice is very important also. So what are some of the strategies that we can engage them around food insecurity and their relationship with food long term? Um, you, I, I think Harvesters does a really good job of engaging young people. And part of the reason is because we can reach out to schools and families. We have over 6,000 uh, volunteers every month at Harvesters. Many of those volunteers are children. Uh, there's also an educational aspect so that when you come in to volunteer, um, you know, you may get a tour and, and by the time you go on that tour, you understand how the food comes in, why it comes in, how it goes out and who it goes to. And then you actually have an opportunity to touch that food and know that you're making a difference. And so, you know, we wind up with children who I wish I had, who for birthdays, instead of presents, they want to hold a food drive. And um, just a couple years ago, we started um, doing youth summits. And it's, it, it's a camp really. It's a food insecurity camp at Harvesters and we also have field trips um, around the city and um, we, we started it with high school kids and then they went off to college. So we decided maybe we should go the middle school route. <laughs> um, and so that's what we're doing right now but, but they're like sponges and, and we do see that um, they, they, they really want to make a difference in the lives of others. And, you know, food is often that common denominator, you, you know, and, and they have a lot fewer uh, judgments. For them, it's just a matter, you know, they see, they see plenty and can't understand. And then they ask the question, why? They see plenty and uh, people doing without just just doesn't sit well with them. So, uh, but that's just one way. That's just one way. Uh, they can go volunteer for ball. Well, and I think <coughs> service learning, like Northland Caps, for example, last year did a feeding uh, thing around the holidays in the Northland. <coughs> but also what we're experimenting with is a pilot at Winnetonka High School where out of the school they decided they wanted a food pantry on site. And so we're working with our partners at Harvesters, Feed Northland Kids, Backpack Shepherds to create a school-based pantry that the ultimate goal is that the, child, the students will run it themselves. And that it's about that real intentionality, about making it as close to home as possible. Um, and I think Harvester's youth um, work is amazing. And I think what like, organizations like Casey Healthy, Casey Healthy Kids, it's talking about um, access to food and access to healthy living. I think we're starting at really young ages and we have to find that age appropriate way, but it's that journey that it's starting with that children's book at age four that talks about the empty little pantry and then moving to collecting food and then talking about their space at their own school and what food access looks like, then getting them to come to the Kansas City Community Kitchen and harvesters. Uh, we got to start earlier of taking people on this journey that they understand that's where we're going to make the true deepest systemic change is by generationally looking at what this looks like. And I would also put a plug in for traditional organizations like, say, 4-H, which yeah. was something that I grew up in. But 4-H is, a lot of people say, oh, it's about, you know, doing gardening or photography or something like that. But it's, at its heart, it's about citizenship. And engaging people in civic 
activities is really an important aspect of it because it's only when we like think that we can act collectively together that we can address these huge issues of food insecurity, of poverty, of those kinds of things. So youth can be engaged at all levels in that work. You know, if 4-H starts at like eight or nine years old, FFA is another thing, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, I mean, all kinds of ways. There's organizations out there that are, are engaging youth and, and gardening is one part of it, not just gleaning and feeding, but gardening, um, get, uh, building skill sets. But then also the idea that we can co collectively work together, achieve things together as citizens, I think is actually really important too. And finally, I would say that both Kansas State and University of Missouri have hosted the university's Fighting um, Hunger uh, uh, program. Um, we unfortunately we also have student uh, pantries on our campuses and that is becoming a growing phenomena among um, universities. Almost all of the universities in the SEC for us um, in the Big 12 for KU and K-State um, have food pantries that are available for students and staff and so that you know <coughs> that reflects the cost of college now um, those are those are big issues. So I, I do think that there are a lot of ways to engage lots of folks at all stages of the lifespan. But but I would say too, children learn by what they see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have our first fact check of the evening. Oh, thanks. Uh -oh. That's probably uh -oh. me. Uh -oh. <laughs> Earlier, Dr. McNell uh, was talking about the USDA budget and she challenged me to, to fact check her. So the, uh, actually the USDA budget outlays for um, nutritional and assistance is for 19, 2017 was 71%, and that's been pretty steady over the last five years, back to 2013. Uh, the rest of that, the farm and commodity products programs are 16%, and then conservation and forestry is 7%, and all others is 6%. And I had one other uh, fact to check. Uh, if the federal budget for food assistance program is decreased, is there enough food waste to compensate for the decrease in federal funds? Now, we didn't have a, quite an answer to that, but uh, the USDA Economic Research Service estimates that 31% or $161 billion uh, worth of food wa was wasted in 2010. Uh, <clears throat> $161 billion worth. 31%, I'm, I'm assuming, of the... Um, total food in the GDP. It's from retail to yes. consumer. It doesn't include what is uh, never harvested. That figure oh, doesn't. Okay. And I just want to say one thing that scares me when we start going down the path that food rescue is the answer. Um, it's not. Like, the answer can't just be scrape everything off your plate and give it to somebody else. Like, that's not sustainable. It's not healthy. There's a lot of other stuff. So I, I always get very anxious when I hear, and we hear a lot of it right now with, with the way the budget's going. Is this like, well, there's plenty of food. Just go find it. It's resource intensive. I mean, we got to send drivers out and you got to coordinate and like you're already looking at shelf life. I mean, there's a lot that plays into that, but that's not the only answer. It's a part. And I think we need to be very aware that if we go down that route, I think we're going to create more problems than good at the end of the day. So we just need to really watch that idea of food rescue being the answer. So Janet Poppendick wrote a book called Sweet Charity way back in 1991. The emergency food system has changed greatly since that. But one of the things she talks about is inefficiency, right? And what, frankly, businesses are all about efficiency, right? <laughs> because that's what makes their, their uh, bottom line go. And so if we can um, make sure that the, that food, it, uh, we're not wasting food, it's coming through there, but like things like SNAP, I, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but if we're letting people buy food, it's an efficient way to get the food to them. And we really want Valerie's organization and so on to be what they are, an emergency system. That's what you would prefer to be. Is, is to be there for, for natural disasters, to be there when people have, uh, have something unexpected that happens, not to be, be there for chronic 
usage, right? I mean, every food banker I've ever talked to has said that's what we want to do, is to be there when people are really in need, but that we have to address these chronic food security issues in ways, in, in, in ways that we can do it through the business arena or through a household arena and so on. And I think just out of the challenges that we're facing is that often the nonprofit community is behind the business community. But I think food banking, for example, is really taking monumental steps to become more efficient. Uh, when I was at Food Bank for New York City, Toyota adopted us and did Kaizen workshops with every single department. You know, we looked at best <laughs> practices from organizations like FedEx who only make right turns or whatever. And we can do that too. And I think we can be more efficient in the work that we do. And there's great stuff like Harvesters has a top of the line inventory management system for when people go and pick that is light years above what it used to be in food systems where we're like hey there's some shelves pick something off of it um, and I think we're watching that but we need we need people to invest in that that doesn't come free always we try really hard but we need to invest in becoming smarter and more efficient and more effective in how we handle product so I'm told we have time for one more question so I saved the hard question for last and this is actually, I'm actually combining two questions. Can we really win this fight of food insecurity? And the second question, if we have a right to health care, why don't we have a right to quality food? I will say that just for a, a right implies a duty. A right implies a duty. If somebody has a right, there's a duty from society to fulfill that, right? And we have chosen as a society that that is not what, what we've chosen to do. So that we have not been a signatory to the, the UN right to food declarations. We have chosen as a society not to do that. And partly we have to ask ourselves, is that because we, we don't want the duty to fulfill that right? And I think that's an important question that we have to address ourselves collectively. I don't know if I could answer that more succinctly. Um, if we want to end food insecurity, we certainly have the means. We own, now we need to couple that with the will and we could make it happen. But that is true for a lot of things. Um, we could end poverty if we had the will, because the resources are there. And so I, I think that is a, a question that we as a people in our own humanity have to ask ourselves and, uh, and, and then put that forth as this is what we stand on because this is what we stand for. I, I think, I, I, think <clears throat> I would pull up that question a little bit I think that we have a right to access to health care, but I don't think we actually have a right to health care in this country. Not everyone, ha a lot, there's a lot of people who are uninsured. It overlaps heavily with the people who are um, food insecure. Um, and so that's probably an issue for another panel. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that, so, so, so I think we don't have that, and so even less so do we feel that there's a, a right to have quality food. Um, I do think, though, that health care expenditures are, uh, can contribute to food insecurity because it contributes to poverty, and so I think that's a great way to address this issue is pushing for more and better coverage for people because um, <clears throat> every dollar that's not spent on health care is one that could be spent on food. Um, and as to whether we can solve the issue, I believe yes. I think all of us up here think yes. And I also think we have to. I just don't think that this is sustainable. And it, it, maybe we'll solve it through this way or we'll solve it through some sort of collapse. But hopefully that's not the case. But yes, I do think we can solve it. And I think there are opportunities for lots of places where we can do good work. Uh, well said. Because we pay no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. We choose when we pay. Or who, or yes, and who pays, whether it's me or my right. grandkids. Or. That's right. But I think that there, I mean, I have students that are, are amazing, like at the University of Missouri. These are amazing students who are like really thinking creative and 
got a lot of energy and it's like Valerie says, you know, they're they're like they're they have a will. Mm -hmm. And those are the folks that we really want to encourage because they have a will to to change and I think that's really important. Okay, so our final question. And every member of the panel was forewarned about this that we would wrap up by asking the question, so what? And now what? And I will also have a now what at the end. So let's start with you, Valerie. Is it fair for me to go first when I went first initially? Oh, oh, oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I, so what? I'm, I'm going to take it back to, to, to the last question. If we truly value the sanctity of life, then we have to value those things that sustain us. And we have to value making sure that every living being has what they need to be sustained. And then what was the other part? Uh, I'm sorry. Now what? Now what? Yeah. So now what? <laughs> I say let's give voice um, to this issue. And let's make sure that everyone among us, uh, because we share, is aware of the problem of food insecurity and the consequences that it has on those people who um, are food insecure and on our community, our schools, our businesses, our families, so that we all can create the wheel because we have the means. Lily? So for my so what, um, I, this is tough. Um, there are over 40 million people in our country who don't have enough food to eat. And I guess my so what is, is that the world that we want to live in? And that's a decision that we need to make individually and collectively. Um, for the now what, I'd say three things. One, promote and advocate for policies that directly address food insecurity. For example, promote universal eligibility of school lunches in your communities um, so that every child has access to free and reduced lunch, not just those with a certain income. Two, promote and advocate policies that address poverty more generally. Um, push for expansion of healthcare coverage, expansion of Medicaid, um, protect cuts to wages, promote better wages, promote um, employer health insurance. And three is uh, exercise compassion and listen, recognize that those 40 million people uh, are experiencing something that you may not have to. And so their experience of it is valid and real and they may experience it in a way that you don't agree with, but it doesn't make it less valid or real. And so if you're gonna ask them the question, be ready to listen for the answer. I think the so what is that we are all, every single one of us, one moment away from being food insecure. It could be a tornado. It could be a flood. It could be a loss of a job. It could be your car breaks down. It could be a multitude of things. Your grocery store closes in your neighborhood. We are all there. I think what's important and what we need to do now is we need to build relationships in our community. Um, come to the Kansas City Community Kitchen and eat a meal. Sit down with the 350, 450 people who come and eat during our three-hour lunch shift, Monday through Friday. Come and eat a meal. And then sign up to volunteer so that you can see what it's like to be a part of that community truly and engaged in a meaningful way. So I would say that there's, we've started. We know, right? Knowing is the first step. And I think we really have to understand this as a systems issue, and sometimes that's a wicked problem. I like to say it's a wicked problem. Wicked problems never get total solutions. There's some answers that are better than other answers. There's lots of stakeholders involved, so there's lots of negotiation. Politics is not a dirty word. It's about how we solve the, um, um, <coughs> interests, you know, differing interests in our community. So I think those are all things that we we have to uh, say that we can do. I think we need to know more about the conditions that the people who bring the food to you have, the farmers. You know, two-fifths of American farmers um, that, that identify as full-time farmers netted less than $1,000 in farm income in 2015. Two-fifths of those full-time farmers. 
small farmers, let's just say that are full time. But we have to think about that and farm workers and, and processing workers and uh, slaughterhouse workers and so on. But we need to think about, you know, um, stable, stable farm employment, stable uh, processing employment, paid time off, those little things that may increase a little bit of the price we pay for food, right? Those are some things that I think we have to, we have to think about if we're going to address food insecurity. And then I think we need to look at some of the innovative programs that are out there. Um, Double Up Food Bucks has been mentioned several times. I think it's an interesting program. It, it helps farmers. It helps um, food insecure folks. Are there things we can learn about it? Yes. But you know, that's part of the 2008 Farm Bill. It's up for discussion next year. So if you think that's a good program, if you would like to learn more about it, then now's the time to do it and to talk to your federal re representatives about it. Um, and then I think that we have to take the policy approach that are really systemic policies about that are ecological, that preserve ecological capital, economic capital, uh, uh, social capital ar across our food system. And those are things like the Greater Kansas City Food Policy Coalition is doing everything from things like zoning to water usage, but then also big problems around uh, um, education and, and, and food security, uh, carrot gold program, those kinds of things are really important um, elements of addressing system-wide change. And if we think about it as system-wide change, we all can find a place to participate, and it's all important. And, um, it, it, and really, the Farm Bill is important. You know, this is important, 2018, Farm Bill. <laughs> Especially in the Midwest. We need our voice. <laughs> Mary, you made my job easy um, on action. Absolutely right. We have a resource in Kansas City, the Greater Kansas City Food Policy Coalition. Uh, it needs more than just programs. We need to stay engaged in changing policies because policies will change our environment and our systems for the long term. Sign up to get action alerts from the, uh, about the Food Policy Coalition so that you can make your voice heard to your legislators in Kansas and Missouri. That's especially important around the food, uh, the farm bill. And the Food Policy Coalition luncheon is on November 29th. So if you want to learn more about food systems and continue this great conversation, then join us because the more people who are involved, the more likely we're gonna be able to see the solutions that we want to see happen for Kansas City and more broadly for this whole region. So kchealthykids.org. And, oh, Valerie, one more? One more. I, I just wanna say that Harvesters does um, a paper plate campaign, and it is a part of our advocacy effort. Um, I have paper plates in the back of the room, and on one side it says, when I am hungry, I cannot. And we just ask people to fill in that blank, and then if you turn that plate over, there's a message about what you can do to help end hunger. Uh, we often send these plates to our legislators. Uh, we, we do lots of thing with, things with uh, those plates in terms of awareness building, and there's a box back there. If you would just take a moment to fill it out, I would greatly appreciate it. And of course, I fill it out myself, and when I'm hungry, I can't think, and I can't make good decisions. And I have a staff of 125 people. I have to make good decisions. <laughs> so before we turn it over, I guess it would be fair to say happy Thanksgiving to all of you and to think about the food that you're eating in two weeks. So, so what is, thank you all for being here. Uh, now what is, let's give a round of applause to our panel. I also want to thank our fact checkers. I want to thank our roving reporter. Uh, Ron, where are you? There you are. Thank you very much. Uh, we have something for the panelists and our moderator. Uh, we talked about the civility bells at the beginning. We're presenting each one of them with an engraved civility bell. And the idea is we ask you to take it to your office or your home, whichever is appropriate. When, the, <laughs> when, when things get a little out of hand, hit the bell and reset and start again. And we appreciate your, everything that you did. We want to thank our sponsors again tonight, the Healthcare Foundation, the Kellogg Foundation, and Children's Mercy. Uh, there are a few individuals I'd like to acknowledge. Jennifer Sykes from the Healthcare Foundation. Jennifer, if she has, she, okay, she uh, uh, 
have played a crucial role in all of this happening. Uh, we've got a few people here from American Public Square that never get acknowledged. I'm going to take two seconds to do it. We have Jeff over Trendorf over here, who's stand up, Jeff, who's our program director. We have Marla Schuld in the back, who is our development director. She's the one who'll be asking you for money. Uh, we have uh, Monty Holman is over here, who is our communication, uh, he, uh, social media graphics person who basically makes us look a lot better all the time. I know I'm, Carol, where are you, Carol, somewhere is here. There's Carol, she's out in the back. She is the one who basically is one of our administrative uh, people that makes things work. We have Kaylee right here who not only has been our intern, but is about to start a, a, we hope, a podcast program for us. And of course, we have uh, Alana Mueller here, who is the uh, outreach director and community co coordinator. And then we have the person who makes everything work on time, and that's Kim Jacobs. Kim, raise your hand in the back there. You know, I think that uh, there's one other person I need to thank, the person who puts up with me through all of this over all these years, and that, of course, is my wife, Nancy. Where are you, Nancy? All right, hey, there she is, okay. Uh, I want to ask you all to please complete the survey on your table. It it's literally should take you less than 30 seconds, maybe a minute. The next program we have is the 6th of December. It's at the Truman Library. It's on NATO. The title is NATO Truman to Trump. As you all know, the whole issue of NATO has been somewhat in this it should be a fairly a robust conversation people who have a very different view on what our role should be with nato more information is in your playbill uh in 2018 we will have a program on the affordable care act and again you will get uh more information on our website as that comes into and it'll be with the Healthcare foundation again so we will get more details on that soon if you want to become a member of american public square which if you're not already we would like you to be uh, let's pick up the information on one of the tables at the back. And finally, as I do often, I, I want to leave you all with some words which I think sort of capture the mission of what we've all been trying to do on a regular basis. And in a country that's dividing by economic prospects, by years of education, by the look and feel of what constitutes a family and by political persuasion, we continue to believe that there might be a more important message that we all need to hear. The message people living in a democracy must understand, more than any other message, is that there are Americans who are not just like you. They don't live like you, they don't have families like yours, and they don't think like you. They may not live in your neighborhood, but this is their country too. So thank you all very much. Good night.